foundations of the transatlantic relationship, like really nothing in the 70-year post-war history. Um, we saw sharp differences on pretty much every major issue between the United States and Europe, whether on trade, climate, approach to China, NATO, Russia, and basic uh, democratic values. Uh, President Biden promised a return to normal, whatever normal really means. Uh, I think we'll talk about that today. Uh, but it has not been a smooth ride, as the events of the past couple of weeks show. Uh, and even before the events in Afghanistan, um, we saw decisions like uh, the US position on Nord Stream, the decision not to protest that project going forward, obviously causing a lot of upset certainly in this part of Europe. Um, meanwhile, domestically, the United States has been riven over the past several years by a uh, series of extremely contentious debates over race and gender uh, and society, uh, whether you want to call it political correctness or wokeness. Uh, the country is extremely divided. Um, in the aftermath of the 2020 election, we had the outgoing president refusing to accept the results, which is unprecedented in American history, uh, leading up to the events of January 6, which is something that certainly uh, I never expected seeing in my country. Uh, this all leaves us with the question, which I think the title of this panel um, is getting at, which is, is the United States still the shining city on a hill, as Ronald Reagan said? Um, and to discuss this, we have a distinguished panel, uh, my fellow Washingtonian, Steve Clemens from the Hill newspaper, um, Uli Speck from the uh, German Marshall Fund of the United States, Rob DeVeik from the Hague uh, Conference for Strategic Studies, and Sylvie Kaufman, who is the editorial director of Le Monde. So I am going to let our panelists open with some brief remarks of about six minutes. I'm going to hold you to that. Um, and then I'll ask a series of questions, then we'll open it up to the audience. So I think we'll just go down this way. So Steve, why don't you start? I'll make sure I time myself as well. First of all, it's a real pleasure to be here. I was in Estonia the day after I was told um, Russian troops left. It was in 1994. I saw uh, one car in the kind of town square. It was Genscher uh, in town, but it was a very different Estonia at that time, and I haven't been back since. So to Eva and to her team, who've done an extraordinary job uh, with this conference, thank you so much uh, for, for this. It's been eye-opening in so many ways. I've also talked to so many of you and, and get a sense of the frustration and the um, disappointment in the United States. So I imagine that some of my comments this morning are going to be frustrating for some of you. But let me just start by very quickly saying with regards to Afghanistan, which is on many people's mind, and it is one of the, the key elements right now. As Jamie said, I agree with everything that Jamie said, but there are these anchors that have to be looked at with regard to not only what has happened in the transatlantic relationship, but where it is going. And I imagine I have different views about the strategic equities of Afghanistan than some of those in the room. But I've also been very aware over the last week that I've literally had hundreds of emails of, um, from people desperate to get uh, uh, interpreters, to get family members, to get um, uh, brilliant women out of Afghanistan. Uh, there's a perception that um, uh, I, because as, as Jamie and I are both journalists in Washington, that we know people and that anyone knowing anyone that might be anywhere near the White House or anywhere near any position of influence has been besieged by people trying to save people in this time. It's been heart wrenching. It's been very hard uh, for those of us who feel so impotent given the events that unfolded. Some of you may know Mike Rogers, the former chair of the House Intel Committee. His wife, Christy, is an extraordinary woman who is very involved with special forces in both Afghanistan and Iraq. There's a story, well, you'll one day, it'll, I imagine it will be a, a movie, of 29 extraordinary Afghan women who worked covertly in supporting the efforts of US special forces in Afghanistan. She was working uh, over these last several weeks to get those women to freedom because someone had been tortured uh, and, and gave up the names of those women. And so the Taliban were going out to try to find them and execute them. 16 of those women, by the last time I spoke to Christy Rogers, had gotten to safety. There were still uh, a number of them that had not. Um, and I don't know their situation today, but I say that 
when I when my, make my comments about Afghanistan and where I think it fits, I want people to understand. I understand the emotional trauma, the debate, and it has been wrenching uh, for I think many of you, but also for me and seeing how this unfolded. That being said, you know, I see, uh, I think back, I'll be brief about this, I have two more minutes, three more minutes. Uh, David Petraeus some years ago in 2010, uh, 2009, 2010, sat in a committee of the Foreign Relations uh, Committee in the U.S. Senate and testified before then Senator, uh, Senate Chairman uh, Richard Lugar, uh, Chairman of the, the uh, Foreign Relations Committee. And Lugar asked Petraeus, who was then head of ISAF in Afghanistan, where did Afghanistan fit on the map of America's strategic priorities? What did it, what did it mean to win or lose? Where did it fit given other issues? And Petraeus's response at that time was, I can't answer that question. All I can do is talk about Afghanistan and figure out what it takes to do Afghanistan, but I will not weigh in on whether it was a strategically significant investment of American resources. And I think that that lack, that, that inability to defend Afghanistan as a, a key strategic priority at that moment has been something we've been wrestling around and faking it ever since. And what Joe Biden, and I think find this, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude there because there'll be a lot to open up. Joe Biden had a clarity about this that he brought as vice president that Afghanistan never ranked as a significant strategic uh, equity that was worth investing in. From the very beginning, he joined this. Now, you can disagree with that, but Biden was very clear of mind. He was very clear of mind when he was in the Obama administration, when they did the Afghanistan uh, review. He was of that position, and he was of that view when he came in. I think one of the things we'll be trying to sort out about Afghanistan for years, uh, if anyone continues to be interested, because I have to tell you, interest in Afghanistan within the United States is incredibly low. And the ambivalence and antipathy about Afghanistan and America's commitment to the American public is very low. But the key question is, why did Biden's people, why did the Defense Department, why did the State Department, from the first day that Joe Biden was elected, even before inaugurated, not begin knowing exactly that he would never consent to an extension after he had done the, the May extension to August, but never change his mind, because he always was very clear. And I guess the French got the signal because they began moving people in May. But the United States and the Defense Department, others were slow rolling Biden because they expected themselves that there would be an extension, that it would be a replay of what happened with President Obama. We can debate all of this later. I don't want to go over time, but I want to say that it shows incompetence at some level in the Biden administration, but it also shows that many of our friends in Europe failed to listen to. I mean, Joe Biden, and I knew, I, I knew the president, I knew what his, where his mind was, but I've known where he was since 2009 and the clear, clarity purpose. And so the handwriting was on the wall, and now we're acting like, oh my god, we, we were so surprised that this happened and that this went the direction. Now, I'll finish just with a point that, that, that will be controversial. I've been shocked to hear the number of people who think, well, the Chinese and Russians are seeing America cuts and runs, leaves its allies, doesn't do this, and it's great for them. I disagree entirely that when you look at the strategic dimensions, America no longer faced with, you know, essentially a long, high cost, low return, high, high risk, um, uh, you know, strategic distraction, now we'll have capacity, hopefully, and we'll have to test whether Biden has the ability to do this, to be available and move resources and attentions to other security threats that are less geographically fixed um, and less costly, and that we're undermining support in the United States, in my view, for America's global engagement to begin with. I've asked many of you here to say, if the choice was this, between, between the United States continuing this slow simmer in Afghanistan, that would erode and, and, and undermine basic American public support for global American engagement, meaning NATO, meaning Asia, uh, would you rather not cut off Afghanistan to keep NATO? And, that's, and I just want to put it in very stark terms, because I do believe, given what we saw in the Trump administration, that is where we're going, where we were going. And I think what Joe Biden has done is, is an effort to try and turn that around redo the social contract with disaffected American middle class people who felt they fought the Cold War in China won, who were pissed off about the 0809 financial crisis, who feel demeaned by the New York liberal establishment. And I think it's very important to look at those dimensions of the domestic drivers of why Biden was doing, did what he did and to see whether that gives him a chance to re-square American support for U.S. global engagement. Thank you. Uli. 
Yeah. <clears throat> I would like to zoom out a little bit and talk about the broader transatlantic relationship. And I think we, what we are facing is a paradox. I mean, on the one hand, I think with the Biden administration, there's so much agreement in substance when we look at Russia, NATO, China, climate, democracy, and it's quite the opposite of what we saw with the Trump administration. So my expectation was that you know, both sides would quickly you know, come together and figure out what we can do together and align our, po our positions and build strategies because the potential is there. But I'm just wondering now, why, why is this not happening? You know, and I think we can put a lot of blame on both sides as often uh, in a relationship that is not working well. But I think we need to emphasize this again and look at the fundamentals, which are pretty good. I mean, we have faced a real challenge from China, which is a systemic challenge, which is the first time since the end of the Cold War. And I think this should focus our minds. And instead, we see you know, unhappiness, you know, disagreements about, about, I would say, smaller issues. I mean, Nord Stream 2 is controversial, but we all know that the Biden administration has removed this from the agenda in order to work with Germany on bigger, to fry bigger fish, which is probably China. Um, and, then, and then we have Afghanistan, and there's a lot of unhappiness on, on our side, and I, it's fully understandable. We have not been fully part of the process. But on the other hand, I, I have to say, I mean, we had plenty of time. We knew that this would happen. And Trump made this deal with the Taliban. Where were, was Europe at that moment when Biden decided to, uh, to move out? And there was this deadline. And he said, clearly, there's this deal with the Taliban. And our choice is either you know, to, to have another search um, and, and put more American lives at risk or to move out. You can debate this, but this was a clear position. So I think, you know, we are, you know, uh, there's a fundamental unhappiness on the European side, and there is kind of, uh, I think, the Biden administration is just overwhelmed. You know? we, we all face COVID, corona, we all face domestic crisis, and so there's a kind of um, f fatigue. Um, International relations are just, you know, one step too far to uh, bring into consideration. But I think this is a unique moment we have. Also, on the one hand, in order to align ourselves on China, and this requires that we Europeans also come up with something on China together. And I don't see much really going on. We have this consensus of 2019. A European Commission, a nice formula, but where is the practical work? I mean, things are going on, and it's, it's good to see, and Ursula von der Leyen stepped into that and created this uh, trade and, and tech council with the US, but this needs to be filled with life, and this life needs to come from member states and certainly from big capitals. So I think we have this unique moment, also because we don't want another Trump. So let's face it, I mean, uh, if Biden is not successful in his internationalist uh, attitude, if he cannot claim success here and there with the Europeans, it, it won't be the biggest story in the US, but it will be part of this Biden's failure story in the US. So I think we as Europeans have every interest to support Biden as well. So I hope that Nord Stream 2 has been I'm sorry to say, especially here, has been more or less removed from the agenda. Um, I think the Afghan uh, hiccup will be gone because also in Europe, interest in Afghanistan was always pretty low. And um, suddenly it popped up as a major issue because we all have been surprised. And so I hope that we can move uh, across those small relatively small when we compare this with the systemic challenge from China uh, over the small uh, uh, unhappy uh, you know kind of issues that are standing in the way and finally get together and do something together. I don't think we need to worry about another Trump. I think we need to still worry about the real thing. <laughs> Your original article, uh, Rob. Yeah, Phil, thank you very much, uh, James. I completely agree with those arguing that um, uh, it was predictable what Biden would do. 
but that's not the point for us Europeans. Uh, many hoped, in Europe at least, uh, that after President Trump, America first would belong to the past, but in the eyes of quite a few Europeans, uh, the way Biden ended the war in Afghanistan is an indication that the concept is still very much alive. And I think this is really a problem. And what really pissed off the Europeans is that Biden argued that he was not in the business of nation building. We Europeans were. The way America withdrew its troops from uh, Afghanistan was an indication that all the efforts, all the nation building efforts were completely useless and should have, uh, must be terminated. And that is really a huge uh, problem. But in my view, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the way it was done is an indication of, a, of an even bigger change. And I think it's very useful to, uh, to read uh, Biden's text of his television address uh, of the, what is it, the 16th of August. That's a very interesting text. Uh, it was not really covered here in the media very well, but only some quotes were, were taken from the text. But in defending the withdrawal, Biden linked explicitly uh, this withdrawal uh, to his strategic competitors, Russia and, um, and China. And he, he argued that he was no longer willing uh, to funnel um, resources to Afghanistan because that would be in the advantage of Russia and China. So this is great power competition. And I'm not sure uh, that um, in the long run, Russia and China still consider this as a victory. It's, it's probably not if you can divert your resources to great power comp uh, competition. And he also, of course, said uh, that America will be back if the Taliban turns again uh, Afghanistan into a sanctuary for extremist organizations. So Biden sent two messages uh, to Europe. The first is that due to geopolitical shifts, we witness a ri the rise of great power competition. And the second is a confirmation of his policy, foreign policy for the middle class, uh, focusing not anymore on wars of choice, but on wars of necessity. And I think that is crucial. Only if America's vital interests are at stake, they will act. That is a debate we should have also in Europe, uh, because we do not think in those terms, but it is absolutely uh, crucial. So this new reality creates new challenges for Europe. Under President Biden, but also under his uh, successes, this will not be business as usual. Um, unlike his predecessor, unlike Trump, uh, Biden expressed support for NATO. Uh, that's great. But we will not go back to the good old days uh, of an America leading NATO and leading uh, uh, the, the free work uh, world. This is also linked, of course, to democratic, uh, democratic uh, graphic change in the US. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, by 2040, uh, the white Americans will be a minority. So the the focus is completely different, and it will have, have huge political uh, repercussions, and also repercussions for transatlantic relations. And we do not want to see it in Europe. We do not have discussions on it, this, and we should. Uh, the withdrawal of uh, troops from Afghanistan also indicates as a, as a bigger problem. Uh, America provided the enablers. I think we should not underestimate that. If you withdraw the enablers, the whole thing will collapse. And that's exactly what happened in Afghanistan. But in a way, the situation is in Europe is, from a military perspective, a little bit comparable to the situation of the Afghan army. We also need the enablers of the US. If the US withdraws the enablers, the whole thing will collapse. Uh, my institute, the Hague Center for Strategic Study, is carrying out uh, a, a major study uh, for, for the army, the Dutch army. And we concluded that if America withdraws uh, with the, the enablers, that's the end of it. Uh, and there is a real reason to believe that this could happen in the future. Uh, so we have to take this, uh, this, this into, uh, into account. So this paradigm shift should be discussed in, uh, in Europe. It's visible for 
many, many years. But we tend to ignore it because we were quite happy to live under the American nuclear umbrella. So the shift is mainly driven by geopolitics and of course the belief that the two-war strategy, and that is also not discussed in Europe, that the two-war strategy is no longer possible for military reasons. For America, the real challenge is Asia, not Europe. So Asia will be the priority, not Europe. And we Europeans must reconcile with the new um, reality. What is the solution? Well, that we invest in our, in, in our own defenses, of course. Uh, we should also invest in collective capabilities for, for collective uh, defense. We should produce our own enablers. However, in Europe, uh, the whole discussion is paralyzed by stupid institutional discussions on how to improve European capabilities. And this really makes no sense. Uh, hardcore transatlanticists, they argue that, it, that developing your own capabilities, producing your, your own enablers, will go at the expense of the, um, uh, of the transatlantic relations. In my view, this is not the case. Uh, so the whole thing is deadlocked, and we really should come up with something else. And, for example, the PESCO, the Permanent Structured Cooperation Project, should focus more and more also on collective uh, defense. Now, the good news is that you have two instruments in international uh, politics. That is military power and economic power. Military power, we Europeans oh, tend to ignore that. But economic power, that's something else. Yesterday we had a discussion about the EU as a regulatory superpower. I came to the conclusion that indeed the European Union is already a superpower, but it's a completely different superpower than most people think. It's a regulatory superpower. Uh, I wrote a book, unfortunately only in Dutch, but it will be translated, and I asked myself the question, did Xi, Putin and Trump achieve anything meaningful within the European Union? And the answer is no. They didn't achieve anything. Even during, they made advantage of the corona crisis, at least that's what they thought, uh, to improve their position in Europe, and they failed. And the reason is that uh, they have to deal uh, with the exclusive powers of the European Union. Uh, we, the Dutch, the Germans, French have nothing to say about trade policies. They all want trade agreements. They don't get it. Uh, China was denied um, an investment pact, desperately needed by Xi, and he needs one. We use the internal market uh, to impose uh, regulations, rules on other countries. And they now have a global um, a, a global effect. And yesterday also uh, things like the, the GDRP were mentioned, but, but be, make no mistake. For example, the Digital Market Act and the Digital Service Act have huge implications for, for example, American tech firms. So the, the reason why I say this is that if we really move into the direction of great power uh, competition, then all great powers are nuclear powers. And I can assure you then it's not really advisable to start a war. Deterrence will become more and more important. And if deterrence becomes more and more important, you will see a shift to hybrid warfare, on sub Article 5, and geoeconomics. In, in this respect, in geoeconomical terms, the European Union is number one. And it's a big challenge for the US, China, and Russia. Thank you very much. Sylvie. Thank you. Um, you know, as a follow-up to what Rob just said, we have, the, it's quite fascinating how every time there's a tension in the transatlantic relationship, we think it's the first time, or we think it's new. Well, in fact, I would like to give a little bit of historical perspective on this, on what's happening today. Um, it's a process, and this is another stage in the process. And to me, uh, this process started at the end of the Cold War. Uh, Europe and the United States have been drifting apart since the end of the Cold War for a very simple reason. 
which is that it was the Soviet Union which was keeping them together and, and which put them together. Why, you know, the West, we, we've been, we had last night at the night owl discussion on Russia, we had a very interesting discussion about what is the West, does it still exist? Uh, where does it start? Where does it end? Does, you know, um, there's a couple of, there, there are two words we don't hear anymore, it's the Western bloc, because the bloc doesn't exist anymore, it's not a bloc. And, and this has, you know, this is not starting with this Afghanistan crisis. It's, it's been the case for some time. So, um, you know, why, what kept the U.S. so involved in Europe, why Europe was so important for the U.S., it's because uh, they wanted to have the balance of power. And so Europe was essential in the balance of power with the Soviet Union. Now the power is some, somewhere else. Uh, it's in China, and Europe is not so important anymore, but we don't want to see it, the Europeans. We still think, you know, we have to be uh, uh, this uncomfortable position in, in this block, which doesn't exist anymore. But so we had several episodes to, to illustrate this. We had 9-11. 9-11, it's interesting because now it's seen as you know, this beautiful moment of Western solidarity, and it's true, Article 5, was uh, called for for the first time. But if you look closer at it, uh, there were tensions between the Allies around uh, September 11, including when, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Brits intervened with the, the, they were in Afghanistan first with, with the, the Americans. Uh, other Western allies were uh, represented at military, senior military level at the CENTCOM in Tampa, Florida. And if you talk to those uh, French or other European um, generals who were there, you know, they were not so happy about the cooperation. There was no consultation. They were not informed. Their forces were going to be involved in that fighting in Afghanistan, but it was an American operation and it was, you know, designed to be so. So, but again, you know, we, we now say we went in together, out together. That was an American-led operation, and that's why now we are surprised that there was no consultation on the withdrawal, but it's, you know, it's the way it works. Um, then we had uh, Iraq. Talk about a big, you know, deep division between the Allies. The Iraqi war was uh, really a, a, a very serious um, division, and, and then, of course, France and Germany uh, stayed away from it, uh, but you, the fact is that uh, the United States didn't mind dividing Europe at that time over Iraq. The, you know, it was not only France and Germany, there, was, there were really deep divisions in Europe. We, the, the Central European uh, countries went along with, with America, and that was really, of course, the uh, uh, United Kingdom, and the consequences of that division were felt quite a long, for a long time. Um, then Obama. Uh, so Obama started the pivot to Asia. Again, Europeans, you know, didn't want to, to get the message. Uh, then there was Syria, 2013, big trauma for the French. They were ready to go uh, because they thought that Obama's red line on, on chemical weapons uh, used against civilian populations were, had to be implemented. The UK, for their own reason, uh, decided uh, differently. But the French planes were ready to, to go and strike, and Obama decided otherwise, and, and, and you know, nothing happened. That's something which also was a very powerful sign, I think, um, of, of, of those two uh, uh, big allies drifting apart. Then there was Trump. <laughs> Trauma for everyone, so I'm not going back to this. Um, maybe the French were less traumatized by Trump because they, uh, you know, they, they, they had their own relationship, rocky relationship with the US. At, at the same time, they had a very strong military cooperation on, on counterterrorism and in Sahel, so it's, it's, it's not such a, a simple uh, caricature. Um, but uh, I think the Germans were probably the most traumatized by Trump and, and the, the experience. And then, so came Biden. And Biden, by some of us, was seen as the savior. And you know it was going to 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 be back to to the nice uh, uh, old times when we can see we're not so nice, but you know uh, 
that's the image we, we like to, to, to keep. And um, of course, at the beginning, um, every, everything was wonderful. You know, America went back to the Paris Agreement on climate change, then the WHO, then, you know, joined the multilateralist system again. Um, JCPOA, so, you know, all, all this stuff. But now we can see that, in fact, there's quite a long, uh, there's quite a strong element of continuity in uh, Biden's foreign policy uh, with Trump. And Afghanistan is one of, is, is one is illustration. But if you look at it, there was no change on, I mean, it was slow to, to work on the tariffs issue. There was no change on extraterritorial sanctions, uh, which is a big issue for the Europeans. Um, you know, no ambition on Israel-Palestine Palestine conflict, uh, no change on Jerusalem as capital of Israel, no change of China, of course. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, on, on, on COVID and the vaccine, there were tensions. Um, I'm not going into details, but uh, then Biden came to Europe. There was this, this NATO summit and G7 and all this. And again, we didn't want to see. Now we know that when there was this uh, announcement, when, when the allies were told about the withdrawal and the date of the withdrawal, nobody, I think the Czech president was the only one to, to say something. So, you know, nobody, uh, the French were not really uh, involved because they have left Afghanistan in 2014. But, you know, it, it, it's again, we didn't want to see the truth. We didn't want to draw uh, the consequences of, uh, of, of, of this uh, drifting apart. And so now we see, um, you, you mentioned the speech, Biden's speech. I think that was clear. Uh, that was very interesting, that speech, because it gave, um, it redefined uh, the American national interest. And now we see that Biden's uh, foreign policy is not going to be a transformative foreign policy as we have seen with previous presidents. It's, it's a kind of adjustment foreign policy. Uh, and we have to draw our own conclusions from this as um, now we have this, uh, we should take advantage and I, I will end up on this, of this, Afghani of this crisis on Afghanistan uh, to, as <laughs> um, my colleague uh, uh, Jeremy Shapiro, who wrote in a, an essay for uh, ECFR, he said, it's time to wake up and smell the post-American coffee. <laughs> so yes, you know, maybe, and, and I'm afraid this wake-up call is just going to be another one because we are slow in Europe and, uh, um, you know, <laughs> we should have uh, been, uh, we should have woken up a long time ago. But um, this is, if, if, if Afghanistan has to be a defining moment, it, it should be and for, for European defense and, and for European uh, autonomy. But I'm afraid it will take t time and maybe another couple of wake-up calls. Um. Steve, I wanted to pick up on something you said that seemed a little bit contradictory, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Probably you right. said that um, the U.S. public interest in Afghanistan was low. And certainly if you compare, I mean, you often hear people would be comparing Vietnam to Afghanistan, um, which is really not, I don't think, accurate. I mean, in the United States, Vietnam was a major domestic political issue. You had the you know, uh, Democratic Convention in 1968. There were, there were violence in the streets in Chicago. You had 55,000 American soldiers killed. Um, it, was a, it had a real domestic impact. And that has not really been the case in Afghanistan. Um, so why was it necessary, therefore, as you said, for President Biden to be, uh, carry out the policy he did in order to sort of restore credibility with a policy of foreign policy engagement abroad, support for NATO and whatnot. Two, two, quick, yeah. two, two quick strains here. One, you know, I, I know it's become vogue to say this is not Vietnam, but Richard Holbrook would have said it is Vietnam. You know, Richard Holbrook uh, invited me to the release of what was the foreign relations volumes of the United States, which essentially is the United States confessing to the things it did and bringing classified uh, material into the public 25 years after something had happened. And Richard had invited me to um, 
here, the, the release of the Foreign Relations volume is about Vietnam. And he said, Steve, I want you to ask me a question. And I said, well, what question do you want me to ask you? And he says, you'll know the question. And so I said, OK, how does Afghanistan compare to Vietnam? And he then, in front of Secretary Clinton and others, talked about why what he did in Vietnam, which was so similar to his role in SRAP with Afghanistan, was in fact leading in the same direction, which was going to be failure. It was, it was hubris in the United States. It was a, so so there, there may be different dimensions when it comes to sort of public awareness, impact, size of scale of footprint. But at least in methodology and framing, even Richard Holbrook saw that apparently the course we were going at that time was still um, one that was not going to produce the results we wanted, either strategically or in terms of nation building. And I found that, Joe, I want to put that out there. That's one element in that response. But the, the other part of this, I'll tell people that Donald Trump got something very right, and, and, and Joe Biden smelled it. I interviewed Joe Biden in 2016 when it was clear that Hillary Clinton was going to run against probably Donald Trump. And he told me on the record that the Democratic Party had become a party of snobs. Oh. And he said um, that we have forgotten the basic person. We, have, we, have, we do not understand the stresses on families across this country that have fought and defended the United States and its objectives around the world. And you know, it's one of the things where I try to investigate, because my family's from Oklahoma, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan. Tried, you know, tried at one point to have discussions with them. And the uh, frustration and anger about the 2008-2009 financial crisis in which they saw New York bailed out while they lost their homes and their 401k savings plans and felt completely left behind. They thought they'd fought the Cold War, that China had won. They came back from military service in Iraq and Afghanistan. They saw their positions happen to my brother, uh, not serving in those places, but he had been in the military, laid off three times by Hewlett Packard, trained his Indian successor. This was the story for many families. Now, all of these families are, are long-term, multi-generation people who served in the military, because the military was the way in which they reached, reached the middle class. So my, my point about the antipathy of people towards Afghans and why there is a similarity, not in terms of the rights and civil rights issues related to Afghans, but the anger about it. And what Donald Trump understood is that the American public, many, many, the big swath of them, used to believe there was a quid pro quo when it came to national service, that they were a part of America's security guarantee to the rest of the world, but they still did okay. They got things from it. Now they were feeling screwed, left behind, and demeaned, and saw no value in US military service. That is what Donald Trump saw. That is what Joe Biden felt. And so when I talk about the choice between America being in NATO and you know, being engaged in the greater global public good, the problem is, probably for the first time in my memory, uh, the domestic lack of support for American global engagement is real, palpable, and widespread. And that's where it comes from. It comes from those dimensions. So that's, that's why I raise that element. And that's why I think Joe Biden trying, in my view, now I may be wrong, but people have said, is Joe Biden an isolationist? Absolutely not. I followed this guy for decades. He's absolutely committed, probably to too conventional in my view, I'm much more avant-garde at what I think America should be doing, but probably to a very conventional set of arrangements and alliances. And he wants to, as, as Sylvie just said, to adjust what is on our strategic priority list. He wants alliances to work, but he looks at this as a black hole that constrains and contains American power, not enhances it, meaning Afghanistan. And that is why I think it matters. I think it matters far more than the strategic class, which is used to ignoring the American public. They're used to getting what they weigh. What they weigh. The generals are, the strategic class, the large superclass of national security experts is used to not thinking about because that's the way it's usually been. But there's something that broke. Uh, during the Obama administration after 2008, 2009, about the basic social contract of why what we were doing abroad, particularly in Afghanistan, mattered. Louis, we have the German elections coming up in a couple of weeks, and it's hard to imagine, but the, the Merkel era will be coming to an end after 16 years. Um, and I wanted, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to ask you about the sort of details of who's, who's up, who's down, but do you think that there will be any sort of significant shift uh, in German foreign policy, um, depending on the various uh, potential coalitions that might emerge? Short answer, no. Um, I think uh, people often focus on Merkel too much, but she really represents a consensus. 
and we see this consensus now in 70 or 80 percent of uh, voters, parties, centrists, they all can enter coalitions with each other. So it's the <coughs> CDU, CSU, the FDP, the Greens and SPD. And um, there's a very broad consensus that German foreign policy rests on two pillars, transatlantic relations, NATO, EU. And uh, there's also in increasing concern, of course, on, about China. So um, I don't think that, you know, I mean, no, nobody will suddenly uh, cancel uh, the, the Minsk uh, uh, deals or negotiations or and then on, I mean, we ha always have these discussions um, among us experts, um, defense spending, um, or are the Greens less trustworthy on this or that? But I think there is, I mean, I just saw uh, Gysi uh, from the left party tweeting that you cannot trust um, SPD and the Greens because they want to achieve the 2% two, 2 goal. Uh, so you hear from CDU that uh, you can trust them because they don't want. So uh, <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a, I, I, I think it will, you know, the, the broad consensus will stay um, and which is the status quo is fine for us broadly. But then again, you know, when the, the crisis comes, like Ukraine in 2015, you know, another chancellor might react differently from the way Merkel has reacted. And then I think the, 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 the views, the foreign policy views, then suddenly matter. Uh, and, and it really matters who, what the person in the chancellery thinks. But if it's just you know, business as usual, if nothing really big happens, you'll see Germany to continue broadly uh, the foreign policy of Merkel. I'm sure meant... there are others in the room who <laughs> vividly disagree. <laughs> Rob, you mentioned um, Joe Biden's August 16th speech, which I agree with you, I think was very important and largely has been overlooked. And you know, in that, he comes out very clearly saying this nation building has been a failure, we're, 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 we're done with this, um, represents a real sort of uh, critique or even an attack on, on what's called the blob, uh, which is, um, well, you could say the Brookings Institution is probably part of the blob, um, uh, part of that sort of Washington DC bubble. It's, it's the mothership. It's the mothership of the blob, yeah, right, blob, blob HQ. Um, and you combine that with Donald Trump and the kind of isolationism on the right. I mean, is this worrisome to Europeans, particularly to someone from a, from a small country? Um, do you think that we are seeing a sort of epical shift in America's view of its global responsibilities? No, I don't think so. It, it's a European problem. Mm. Uh, I, I, I remember I've been so often in Parliament, round tables, hearings, that look, my words now, and I, I think I was more polite uh, in, in Parliament, but nation building is bullshit. Uh, you simply can't do that. Uh, you don't have the resources. Uh, you don't want to uh, uh, devote time to it. Um, you don't have a concept. Um, uh, you have to deal with spoilers. It, it, it can't be done. Well, you can do it if it's a small country, uh, Haiti or Sierra Leone or something like that, but not a big country. And you can even make the calculation uh, how many troops you need. Uh, this was also the problem of, uh, uh, of Iraq, but also Afghanistan. You, you, you simply have need to have more people to, to do this. So you, you start uh, with something, and it's, 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 it will be a failure, especially if you, if, if you don't have the resources to, 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 to do that. Now, this is a big problem. But we Europeans uh, think in terms of human security, not in terms of territorial security, uh, like the Russians uh, do or uh, security of uh, your, um, uh, your global interest. We have a completely different view. I sincerely hope that because of Afghanistan and what happened there, that we will have a shift towards thinking in terms of um, uh, security interest. We, we forgot that. And uh, remember that Europe is postmodern. And this is linked to the massive success of the European Union. We created mechanisms to deal with our problems in Brussels. We don't have wars anymore. That is a, a huge success. But the flip side of it is that we 
don't understand anymore what security is. And we believe that outside the European Union, people think in a similar way, and it is simply not the case. And that is something we should deal with. And what America does, and I, I know Biden, I, I, I talked to him, uh, also in 2000, 2011, I remember that very well, that was the pivot to Asia. And uh, he is right <laughs> in what he is doing. But the problem is that we, don't, we Europeans do not understand it. And I think this is a European problem and not an American problem. Sylvie, so part of the discussion today, we're supposed to be talking about um, sort of the domestic issues in the United States and what effect that is having uh, on our relationships abroad. And so I wanted to ask you, um, and President Macron made some very forthright comments earlier this year. He was criticizing uh, sort of American identity politics and saying that um, they are social science theories imported from American u universities. I think he's slightly wrong. I think they were exported first from French universities into the American universities. <laughs> Maybe there should be a, <clears throat> a VAT tax coming back. But um, I mean, what do you, do you, how is this playing out in, 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 in France? I mean, all these debates we're having, there's a, it's, on, it's on the cover of The Economist this, this week, uh, sort of illiberal liberalism. Um, does this sort of, uh, do you think, um, weakens European confidence in America's ability to project its values if we don't necessarily believe in our values anymore? Uh, it's a huge issue. Yes, there is concern, of course, in Europe uh, about uh, the way the American democracy is going and, and not functioning well. Uh, European, the European Union has its own concerns with various countries. Uh, uh, you know, uh, illiberal, illiberal democracies, and it's an issue we are really struggling with. Uh, um, but I, it, this, this, uh, it. I think you're referring to Macron's interview to Elle magazine where he said, yes, he said that they, um, this um, uh, intersectionality yes. and racialism and had no, um, that was a concern. Islam al is sort of left-wing Islamism. French is in society. Yeah. Well, I think that there were two, two elements in this, um, uh, in this interview, in, in the way he inter wanted to intervene in this debate, it's, there's a polit domestic politics, of course, because he's been trying to attract, uh, you know, there's a presidential election next April, and he's trying to attract center-right voters and right-wing voters. But there's also, I think, a, a deeper element uh, which is related to his thinking. It's, it's uh, he's very, um, he does believe in universalism mm. and, uh, and universal values. and. He, as a lot of intellectuals in, in Europe, uh, he is worried that this emphasis on, on uh, racialism and intersectionality and, and wokeism, if you want to call it this way, um, uh, is, is a threat to universal values mm -hmm. and to the cohesion of, of societies. And so it, it's very much in the, in the French DNA maybe, but there's also the, the, the other component, which is that we have uh, had this um, uh, fight, you know, problem with the Islamist terrorism uh, for a number of years now, and uh, uh, so you don't want to increase tensions in the society. Having this in the background, uh, Islam is now the second religion in France, and so I think, you know, for, for a politician it's also uh, it's not only domestic politics. I think it's also, uh, uh, it goes deeper, uh, you know, f it's all about values and, and the way our democracies are functioning. And, and you know, we have talked here over the past uh, top, uh, couple of days that uh, there has been mention of this uh, summit of democracies which was planned by uh, President Biden which is supposed to happen in December on, on, oh. on Zoom or, I mean, on <laughs> a video conference or I don't know exactly where. But I think the Europeans are very are deeply skeptical on this. Uh, I don't know how it's going so to be. So are a lot of Americans. <laughs> I think probably, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that, that's the broader picture. We all, um, 
um, we are, we're all, I think, seriously worried about the way our democracies are going and the image it projects. And the image it projects, including in Russia, in, in, you know, in, in societies which are not democratic, where, but where there are sections of the, society, of the civil society who are still attracted by the democratic model, but find it more difficult to, you know, to, to, to see it as an inspiring model, not, not mentioning China. Um, so we'll open it up for questions now. I'm just going to mention that Sylvia has to leave 15 minutes early. So if you do have a question for her in particular, please speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, Julia. Yeah. My name is Jana Polirin uh, with ECFR in Berlin. And I have a question to Uli, maybe a bit German navel gazing. <laughs> um, so. You said broad continuity of German foreign policy, and I agree, but when it comes to China and Russia, I would like you to dive a little deeper, because when you look at the position that the Greens um, have been taking lately, but also the FDP on both, vis-a-vis um, -vis Nord Stream 2, um, and they have been very hawkish on China, both parties. And if we assume that both parties will be members of a next coalition government, either led by um, Armin Laschet or uh, by Olaf Scholz, don't you think that will have any effect on our policy? And maybe also that our policy will become a bit more uh, kind of, yeah, hawkish, mm. if, we, if you want to put it like that? Are we, are we taking them in groups? Yeah, why not, uh, sir? Yeah, I'm Bruno Tertre with the Foundation for Strategic Research in Paris. It's a question for Steve. Uh, I believe about two to three million American servicemen and women have served in Iraq and Afghanistan in the past 20 years. That's a huge number. Um, how much do you think the sequence of the past 20 years will affect the way the American military, the corporate culture, and this huge segment of society, if you add of the families, think about their relation with their political masters and the way they, um, I mean, they're serving the president, but they're serving the constitution. They've been engaged in two huge, massive wars, which are now, they are told, were not such good ideas. I'm not passing judgment, but that's the overall message that they get. How much do you think this affects the way they think about their role in American society, uh, the way they think about their future missions, and possibly, and possibly the way they think about their future roles in deterrence and defense vis-a-vis China, Russia, or the next mission that the American presidents will give them? Great question. Um, and one more from James Scher over there. Do you agree that the way that a great power withdraws from a major commitment says as much about its character its understanding of power and its understanding of the world as anything else it does. And if you do agree with that, can you not envisage a realistic alternative to the way this decision was implemented? Thanks. Let's start with um, Uli. Yeah, on the hawkishness, uh, I think we need to distinguish between Russia and China first. I think Merkel has been more, if you want, hawkish on Russia, saving Navalny's life, as, uh, at least that's what he said about her. And then there was a lot of engagement in Belarus. And then 2015-16, I think you have both sides of Merkel. Um, you have Nord Stream, but you also have the other side. So. Um, I think we have a relative hawkishness there, um, while on China she was certainly not hawkish, um, either because she believes that uh, we already lost and we, we are already depending on China, that's what some people think, or she just sticks to the old approach to China, which is uh, they are a partner, they should be a partner, we, sh we can work with them, and we just don't look at at all the stuff that is going on that we don't like. Generally, I think Germany has on China has this business view and the, and the human rights view, which comes now with, with the Greens. 
But what we don't have yet is a real geopolitical view of China. What does it mean for the global balance of power? What does it mean for the international system if a country like China uh, becomes an, a major player? So I think this is something we have to figure out. And I, I think that the FDP made interesting uh, changes in its uh, foreign policy attitude, especially towards China, after uh, their, uh, the head of the party, Lindner, got very badly treated in, in, in Beijing. So there, there's something going on, but both candidates, Laschet and, 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 um, and Scholz, both said that uh, we don't want decoupling from China. That's the, that, that's the code word, which means we don't want to follow the Americans in their approach. So there will be this, this mix, but I think on China, we really need a, a true transatlantic dialogue on, on the level of leaders. We still wait for the US to come you know, up with their strategy. Um, on, on Russia, yes, the Greens are most, and again, I think this comes from the human rights. It comes from the support for dissidents in Central Europe in, in Russia. So there are deep links. There are many, many Green MEPs, MPs, who are very engaged in, in, in that. The, the, so the Greens are very critical towards uh, the Kremlin. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, most decisions are going to be made on, on the le leaders level, which means the, the chancellery. So, so I don't think um, it matters so much at, at the first instance, um, whether it's Scholz or, or Laschet in, in the chancellery. So I, I don't see a clear direction yet. And, and there are so many possibilities we play with, I don't, uh, I think six different coalitions now, and then who gets the foreign ministry, who gets defense. So I think that's why I stick with, you know, broadly uh, expect f continuity, but of course things are going to evolve. Can I ask a follow-up? I mean, is Merkel the most hawkish German chancellor you could possibly have in Germany? <laughs> I mean, just in terms of a politically realistic From leader. the menu we have now, uh, of her, I mean, Baerbock, she really started with an, giving an interview uh, that was quite hawkish for German uh, situation one week after she had been uh, nominated officially. So she started with foreign policy and she clearly has this view that, that we need to, and she wanted to align with the Biden administration on democracy and, and on climate. So this is the link to, uh, to the US, but uh, it looks as if Baerbock is more or less out of the race now, and uh, Scholz and Laschet uh, both are very much, you know, I think in uh, you know, signal continuity because uh, Scholz has been in government since a long time. Uh, he's part of the real uh, consensus of this government, and, and Laschet is from CDU, which will make sure probably that more or less uh, continuity is, is going. Yes, I think on, on some issues, Merkel was really going ahead of Germany, which is Ukraine mainly, where she really had a personal involvement, uh, was very much engaged. So um, I don't think that you get, and she has this Eastern experience which Scholz and, and, and Laschet, Laschet both don't have. So I, I don't think that they are going to be more hawkish on, on Russia, rather the opposite. Steve, can you yeah. answer the question about veterans? Very quick. I just want to say something, because I feel like calling out this hawkishness thing, because I used to um, talk about President Trump. Trump was really great at bluster on China and really crappy at strategy. <laughs> and so when you look at the Huawei debate, for instance, which I found fascinating at the Brussels Forum, I introduced Dieter's renders about the, you know, what they were doing with Huawei, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact is, America and the United States are doing nothing to create that. They're, put, they're putting no muscle or financial support between Ericsson and Nokia to basically come in, which are the only two real alternatives. So, so you know, to go to Rob's point about the economic dimensions of this, I hear a lot of bluster, hawkishness, posturing. Maybe you talk about military response to China, which is bullshit. Are we ready for a split internet? Are we ready for a war over standards? Where are the industrial yeah. policy dimensions of that? So I just want us to be careful. When we talk about hawkishness, what do you mean? Because Trump's hawkishness meant nothing, and the Chinese loved it. Because he was discussing you know, trade wars over chicken feet or agriculture. 
You know, not talking about AI, not talking about next generation quantum computing in the advance. Now, the Endless Frontier Act in the United States is a, is a step in. I just want to put that in there because I, I go to these forums and I hear, okay, tell me what's real about hawkishness from Germany. And until you begin to see the economic behaviors, the core, you know, to begin looking at alternatives and how we're going to deal with it, then it's bluster and not real. And so I just put that. Your question, Bruno, is so important on the question of what the impact is of the two, you know, two, uh, uh, million or, or more uh, service people that served in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, Joe Biden puts the number of service people in Afghanistan at 800,000 that have cycled through there. Look, I, I'm going to be reckless in what in, 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 in association because you have to be very careful. I'm not a political scientist. But one of our problems, one of Lloyd Austin's challenges is to figure out how they ferret out extremism within the US military ranks how they look at the US military participation and support for what happened on January 6th. I mentioned the 0809 financial crisis, you know, relatives of mine that were impacted uh, by feeling demeaned, left behind, and how people that largely have been middle of the road independents, I'm an independent, became strong Trump supporters. They're from military families. Now, what, now do, do, you know, in the cult of Trump, what does that mean? It means a frustration and anger and a belief that, a, that a, another part, there's a zero sum game now between different parts uh, of the country, you know, and in, in how they look at it. And they look at in many in the military, I think, and I don't want to say they all do, but many in the military look at the kind of liberal establishment as an enemy within. And we haven't figured that out yet. But my, my belief is, my personal belief is, that the stress of these long-term wars without an end or a purpose, a strategic rationale that you could easily explain and defend, has, um, along with the economic crises that hit the country and the feeling that there was a hopelessness, particularly um, at a certain time, you know, there were uh, 5,000 people in New York uh, based financial firms bailed out by the US government that within 12 months had million dollar or more bonuses. That was reported throughout the sort of uh, broad press. So you look at how they felt as they were losing their homes, et cetera, et cetera, though having served in the military. You, th those are some of the dimensions that I worry about. So great question. To your question, I can tell that you and I probably disagree. I do think that the way a nation leaves is important, and that's why I started with the preamble edit. I don't believe in this case it's, it's necessarily defining. When Donald Trump uh, went to South Korea on his first Asia trip, went to the U.S. military base outside of Seoul and said at the end of his well-scripted speech where he stayed on, on uh, the teleprompter and stayed on script until the end, it was at 3 in the morning, I was on MSNBC commenting on it, maybe the only guy who paid attention, but he said, this base isn't even for our security. It's for your security. We could care less about you. But he basically said he undid the whole reason why he was there, the Helsinki summit, questioning NATO. Donald Trump did so much damage to the broader question that I would put right on par with the messiness of how uh, we departed Afghanistan, the pain and horror of that which I acknowledge. That being said, you have to think at the end of the day, you know, we as journalists you know, try to stay, take a step back and say, Biden's decisiveness with the generals who did not want to do this may be a net plus for him politically down the road. It may be a net plus for these people who felt disaffected in the military and Midwest. It may be a reorientation. And I'll tell you, Bob Kaplan, Robert Kaplan, um, used to give these, was, giving, was arranged by Condi Rice to give these tutorials to George W. Bush about US foreign policy. And, and, and Bob crashed on my couch you know, one night when he came down to do this. And I said, what, you know, what was the big zinger? And he says, well, the one big zinger is George W. Bush reads. He read my book, Eastward to Tartary, which was a bitch of a book to read. And, and, and Bush had a footnote. But in the end, what Kaplan had told Bush was, look, you're going to have to talk the talk of democracy, but you're going to have to deal with thugs. You're going to have to deal with nasty people. You're going to have to do deals with them at some point. And to some degree, the facade has just come off Joe Biden. I've always believed that Joe Biden was a realist, and nobody believed me. But you're going to see Joe Biden's realism in this. It's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. When we talk, you know, with Jamie talking about democratic values and these issues, he's going to talk that talk as he always has. But he's making harder judgments that follow a realist code. So, Sylvie, do you have a response to what James yeah. asked? Well, I, as the saying goes, there's no elegant way to lose a war, I guess. Uh, but I'm. You know, you mentioned, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> before, before this uh, Afghanistan uh, debacle, you mentioned another 
I forgot, sorry. Uh, but in my view, uh, I think the Iraqi war, the Iraqi fiasco was even more serious. Um, and the consequences of it, well, we don't know. It's too early to, to be able to fathom exactly what, you know, what the consequences of this uh, uh, Afghanistan crisis will be, but uh, in, in the region and elsewhere. But um, you know, the, we still live with the consequences of the Iraqi invasion. Uh, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, you know, uh, uh, the Arab Spring, and so on. So, uh, you know, these are the debate we are starting to have also is on foreign interventions and what, what, what are we going to do now? How are we going to deal with this kind of situation? Uh, and that's also a, a big question for Europe and, and, and notably for, for the intervention in Sahel. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I must say America went through a lot of this kind of uh, failures and, and fiascos and, and the, the great thing about America is that they are in the open and we all talk about it. There's no omerta about this and, and so, um, you know, at least um, we can discuss it freely <laughs> and, and that's, you know, it looks ugly sometimes but that's also I think a great asset and I think the focus of course now is on China but Maybe it's a good thing that uh, the United States is regrouping and, and trying to hopefully build back its democracy, you know, uh, keep its uh, uh, techno technological uh, um, innovation uh, machine and process uh, alive and well and, and competing with China. And so, but now, and, and the debate, I think, and we were having it, is, is for Europe. What, what are we doing now if the, if the United States is focusing on all these challenges? You know, it's now uh, up to us to, to do our part and without having to act against the United States. I think it's, it's becoming quite clear now in the European Union that this can be done with the United States. And, and it's also a question for the United States. Will, you know, is it, we're all talking about the blindness of the Europeans who didn't want to see uh, the reality, but there's also quite a lot of ambivalence and ambiguity on the American side. Are they really ready? Is, is the United States really ready to um, have Europeans, in case Europeans are ready, you know, to do their own part and, and, and share the decision process? And so that's, that's also another question. Like the French. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I completely agree with you, uh, uh, James, uh, because it tells you something about uh, the way a great power thinks. But I cannot see how to do it in another way. Uh, because um, uh, if you do not provide the enablers to the Afghan army, then you know that when you withdraw your troops, the whole thing will collapse. The big thing is, of course, uh, the, uh, the evacuation. That was a mess. And I think that is also uh, why Biden is so, so much criticized. There was an, uh, an idea by uh, uh, Secretary Wallace in the, in, in the UK uh, to um, provide security with European forces. That failed. Why? Because they don't have the enablers. They needed the Americans for, uh, for that. So even here, the, the Brits made clear that the Europeans can't, can't do that. That's uh, quite interesting, by the, by the way. Uh, Biden can still be right. We tend to forget that. We discuss now the day after, and indeed, it's, it looks terrible. But how does it look in two, three months' time? If the Taliban is able to produce some stability in the country, so that the NGOs, and they can do it right now, eh? they can work, they can continue their work in large parts of Afghanistan. And if they can do that in the future, um, it, and it all depends on how the Taliban is going to deal with ISIL. But if it is, if it is li really quiet, then we will say, oh, Biden was right in the end. And we will forget 
uh, Afghanistan. It really depends on the internal situation in Afghanistan. And we forget the mess, because we always forget the mess, and we, we jump from one crisis to another, so it's not, not a big deal. Uh, so this also is uh, related to the question how much damage to transatlantic relations this has caused. In my view, uh, transatlantic relations will shift from uh, the, the, the military cooperation to the economic cooperation. And here I agree with, um, with Steve. Uh, because here we can cooperate as equal partners. And what is quite interesting is that, for example, Biden took the initiative for a global tax, for tax firms. The, people tend to forget it, but that's crucial. That mean, that is European what he did. And uh, so we, we will see a shift in, under Biden, in my view, in, in the economic cooperation with Europe, and that we will move to joint standard setting, things like that, and joint regulation. If we do that, that has enormous geo, uh, geopolitical implications. And we, in my view, we should do that. So this is not the end of it, but we will, it will, in my view, contribute to a more mature partnership, a more strategic partnership between the EU and, uh, and the US. The problem, however, is Brexit and a couple of countries that do not belong to the European Union. So this, this will be quite interesting. But again, that's a European de a debate. Uh, we'll take another round of questions. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Sorry, Sylvia. <laughs> 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 Uh, the lady over there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Royal. I'm, I work for NATO. Um, I really wanted to ask, we've talked yeah. a fair amount about in this conference about a sort of new era of great power competition. Is that new era going to make our ability to do anything about climate change uh, easier or harder? Okay. Um, right here in the front. <coughs> Hello, André Lezogo Pietri from the Joint European Disruptive Initiative. It's maybe a European question, but it has American. In I mean, we heard very convincingly from Sylvie and Rob about uh, the, the, the blindness of envisioning the, the situation and, and, and that the U.S. shifted focus. But uh, we talk a lot always about strategy and the grand plans, but they seem to be relatively clear. But what is um, blocking us at the European level uh, from an organizational point of view. I mean, the previous panel did not really convince me that from an organizational point of view we had that, that, uh, that grip. And I'll give you a very precise example because technology is, is always... When the National Security Commission on AI tried to look for a couple, a couple of months ago for a partner in Europe, they were, you know, they went from one DG to the other DG. It was very silo. I mean, what needs to happen either at member state or the European Commission level, that really there is a clear purpose, clear strategy, and it can be implemented. Thank you. Uh, Charlie here. In the front. I, thank you. Charlie Saloni is pastor of the Institute of International Affairs. So my question is kind of who's going to rise, US or EU? But I'll ask a very specific Finnish question. Finland's about to choose its next fighters. Uh, the Finnish Defense Forces will pick whatever system fits the Finnish defense system best. The MOD will do the security policy analysis. And since we're gonna be using these into the 2060s, um, who should Finland hitch its wagons to? Trust that vis-a-vis -vis Russia, US interest is continued, or that Europe eventually wakes up and does something? Where goes Finland? Where goes the world? Um, Ian in the back. Thanks very much. Ian Bond from the Center for European Reform. Um, I, I wanted to ask Steve, um, how much can we rely on the resilience of US democracy? I mean, I, I'm really interested in what you say about the, the alienation of the military and military families. Um, You've got a significant number of Republicans saying, you know, the first thing they'll do if they control the House in 2022 is to impeach the president over Afghanistan. 
How much risk is the of the stab in the back legend taking root in U.S. heartland and among those who have connections to the military? Um, and particularly you know, in the light, as you rightly say, of the spread of extremism and the, the connections with the January the 6th insurrection. I want to we'll answer these. So let's start with the uh, climate question. Is there someone who wants to take that? Well, I mean, go, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, climate, uh, fight against climate change relies on uh, the ability of, to convince, convince China um, to um, decarbonize. Um, it's a big issue. The, the, I and think the, the, the debate in India and even Japan, uh, others. But the big debate, I think, is whether the West should sacrifice something, make you know, give give some carrots to China. So maybe on the geopolitical agenda or on the tech agenda. So there is this big debate we're having now um, whether whether we should what we should concede on other issues, issues linking from the Chinese side. And I saw that they started already. I mean, when, uh, now uh, they started to argue that um, that uh, the U.S. is so unfriendly to us, so we won't play ball on climate change. But I, personally, I doubt whether China really, you know, whether we can convince China of doing something that they don't want or they won't do because they're still the priority of the system of uh, delivering growth and, 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 and a carbonized economy still uh, is, is, is cheaper uh, to do that. So I think a lot depends on technological progress and, uh, but of course, it's, it's, it's a big question to what extent we can challenge China on other issues uh, without uh, um, risking them to be too alienated so that they won't yeah. deal with us on the big uh, climate conferences anymore. Can I just say on this, I, I agree with, with Ulrich, but the, what I consider to be a stupid and crazy idea, I'll show my politics, on, on Joe Biden's proposal uh, to waive uh, property rights on COVID. I couldn't understand it because we're not designed to win. We have difference with Europe. We know that Catherine Tai and the U.S. Here are, what was that about? It really was about India saying to us, we want this, and us faking the gesture. Because if we didn't do that, we weren't going to get Indian cooperation where we really need it on climate. So there's a transactionalism that's going on and trading. We often think of silos of things, but there is a, a relationship between those. So that's what I'll just share with that. But I think it's going to become increasingly difficult as we get to real numbers and real targets. And then the other dimension, I guess, you know, we, I hosted Pascal Lamy and others, you know, on the, on the French side of this, of looking at border adjustability, taxes, et cetera, and how we get it. And there's a lot of frustration that the United States is a laggard in that. And, and we're beginning to feel the pressure from Europe over that. And I think that's going to be another dimension where we also begin dealing with looking at China, like who's going to fake compliance within the climate side. So I would tell you that I, I, I think the geopolitical dimensions are going to get nasty and difficult and transactional. Rob? Yeah, on, on climate change, that's a very good question. I think that's one of the very few areas where we can cooperate, for example, with China and Russia. But what we tend to forget is that it also creates, in, long, uh, in the long run, new dependencies, which have a huge geopolitical impact. Uh, we, we start to think about this problem now uh, in, in my country, the Netherlands, uh, because it was completely ignored. Uh, so there was also this idea that uh, when we have this energy transition, we could be completely independent from other countries. And it's simply not true. You can easily make the calculations uh, that, you, that you need imports, uh, uh, also from China, green technologies, which is the biggest provider, which create completely new uh, uh, dependencies. So we now start to have this discussion, but uh, for on, on the short term, uh, this is really one of the areas where you have uh, uh, can have co uh, cooperation, and also because uh, China said that uh, by 2060 they will also be uh, carbon neutral. So that is that's okay. Um, now the, the question on uh, on the blockades at the Euro European level for the blockades for change, uh, I think it's ideology. Uh, I think it's this idea that we, uh, that we cannot do without the Americans. 
uh, it's the, and I already mentioned it, it's a completely different way of looking at uh, security. It's postmodernity. It's uh, a completely different way of looking at security in terms of human security, which is really completely different from the US and, and China or Russia. But it's changing. Uh, I, I see it changing. Uh, and it goes very slow. I was not so long ago in, uh, appointed by, uh, by the cabinet in the Netherlands for a commission, and we had to answer the question whether we should support um, operations, military operations, which, were, which are illegal. And the reason is that because of geopolitical change, we won't get mandates anymore in the UN Security Council uh, for, let's say, operations, uh, peace support operations, or whatever. We don't get it anymore. But sometimes we have to act, and that means that we have to deploy our forces, although we don't have a mandate. So it's an illegal operation. We now start to think, even in my country, which is extremely postmodern, like Germany, by the way, uh, about illegal operations. That's, that's really a big thing. And that is, uh, uh, that's also a signal that we start to understand that the world is changing. Um, and that also means that the European Union is waking up. The, the real strategic player is the Commission. It is not the member states. This is indeed uh, uh, a, a geopolitical uh, uh, commission, uh, like uh, von der Leyen uh, said. And the reason is that the European Union has exclusive powers. We tend to forget that. But they have the power instruments. We, Netherlands, well, too small, but even Germany doesn't have the power instruments. And even in this great power competition, a country like Germany which I admire, like in France, where I live part of the year, uh, they, they cannot achieve their objectives without cooperation within the European Union or with other European allies like, uh, like the UK. You have to do that. So geopolitical change is forcing change upon the European Union and the member states. For that reason, um, I not that uh, interested in all the domestic issues in the US. Uh, because, well, American elections, uh, there, in, there, more time is devoted in media in my country on the American elections than on the, the Dutch or the German elections, which are far more important for us than the American uh, elections. And the reason uh, is that uh, we have uh, American experts, uh, they, they know exactly who does it with who in America? And to be honest, I'm, I'm not interested in that. Uh, it's a kind of Kremlin watching, uh, which we also see in, in, in China. And they tend to forget that it is the geopolitical uh, structure of the world that is forcing change upon. And that is something we tend to forget. And well, that's a message I try to get across all the time. <laughs> um, we have two minutes left. Did, uh, American democracy. Yeah, the resilience Just, of American. Yeah, in two minutes. Um, look, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm worried. I, uh, uh, I I and I think that your your question frames very well, frankly, the challenges and stresses um, that we ought not to um, take lightly. I see. I'm going to get in trouble with this. You know, fanatical demagogues on both sides, and I see very few people publicly trying to build a space, since it was in the Washington Post the other day, I'll announce that I'm pretty close to Joe Manchin, who, whether, wherever you sit on the aisle, is either the most hated or most, one of the most respected people right now trying, and he believes that January 6th was a wake-up call to the Congress that if it didn't fight to create a space, safe space in the middle to do deals, that uh, we would have none. And I agree with him on that, and I've seen whether it's a debate about the filibuster, a debate about um, uh, national security issues, budget issues, um, voting rights, that right now the various players in this are, are winner take all or all or nothing on both sides. And that's before you get to the basic area of, you know, my family from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and what they think about the social contract with America and whether they still believe in America. They believe in the old America. But, and there are also stresses that, and that hits, you know, many of you, we've been talking about migration challenges, the weaponization of migration over here, and places like, you know, the Baltics, 
uh, by Belarus and others, Russia. Um, but, but that same kind of tension exists, and I really think that we have a problem. We don't have the time right now to kind of sort through it all. I'll be happy to talk to you later. But I think it's the most important challenge to figure out how to demonstrate and how to you know, re recreate the theater, essentially, of demonstrating that minority rights matter, that diversity of thought matters, and that, that we create um, winners uh, who have negotiated and compromised to get to outcomes, as opposed to right now what is happening in the system of rewarding fanatics that, uh, in fact, achieve nothing and divide the nation. And that, and that is what is um, driving a lot of what's happening, and I worry about in the American public. Well, on that uplifting note, we will uh, end our discussion today <laughs> I'm and have a coffee break. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good work. Good work.